Hi there, and welcome to Ian's Engage channel. I'm Ian. In previous videos, I've shown how I experimented with both below track and above board solenoid point motors. In this video, I'm going to experiment with SG90 type micro servos to see if they can be used to change points on Shelfington. Figuring out the mechanism I'm going to use to change points on Shelfington has been a nightmare. I've flipped and flopped between different methods for months and still haven't completely made my mind up. The only thing I was certain of was that I didn't want to use underboard servo motors such as the Cobalt or Tortoise slow motion types. However, at the back of my mind, I've always had an inkling that smaller servos, like those used in radio controlled aircraft and cars, may be a good solution for me. They would be small enough to mount into the XPS form and wouldn't need to be physically attached to the track, like solenoid motors, making them easier to service or replace should they fail. The main advantage over solenoid control though was that they were cheap. For instance, I got this lot for less than £20. They actually seem like the perfect solution, so why weren't they the go-to solution for every railway modeller? I guess I was going to find out. For this experiment I was going to use a servo tester to control the servos. With the servo connected to the servo tester and the power supply set to around 5 volts, it was time to see if I could get the servo to move. The controls on the servo tester were simple enough. A button on the tester board could be pressed to centre the servo and the large red dial could be turned to make the servo turn in either direction. In this instance, thankfully, turning the dial turned the servo and pressing the button centred it. So all was good. Having established that at least one of my 12 servos worked, I was now ready to try and move a point with it. I quickly put together a test rig, mounting the servo into some form, adding a control horn to the servo motor, and connecting the horn to the point tie bar using a 1mm diameter push rod that was intended for controlling ailerons on radio controlled model aircraft. I then wired the servo up to the servo tester and operated the large red dial. I was delighted to see that the servo operated the point easily, even with the spring still installed in the point. Obviously, I wouldn't be using a servo tester to control the servos on the actual layout. Instead, I'd be using some sort of DCC accessory decoder so I could control the points using my throttle. I was initially looking at using the DigiKeys DR4024 server controllers, which were capable of controlling four servos at a time, and I'd already purchased a unit ready to test. However, after taking advice from a number of you good folk via a community post, I've changed my mind. I now decided to use a Megapoint server controller, which is capable of controlling 12 servos at a time, and was part of a system that could be upgraded and expanded to include control panels, LED indicator lights, switches, and DCC control. So thanks very much to everyone who made suggestions. They were much appreciated. Anyway, back to the experiment. I wasn't completely happy with everything. For one thing, the servo had a lot more torque than I'd expected, and the twisting motion of the servo in the hole I'd dug out of the foam was quite extreme. I tried to counteract this by adding a strip of grey board beneath the push rod to try and stabilise it, which stopped some of the motion, but not all of it. I then decided to pad the hole around the servo with some thin pieces of cardboard. And this offered more improvement to the stability of the mechanism, but I still wasn't happy with the fix. I also wasn't happy with the position of the servo horn and thought that it needed to be lower. I'd envisaged the push rod travelling across the form instead of being level with the cork road bed. Therefore I decided to make a servo enclosure similar to what I'd used for my below track point motor installation and as demonstrated in video number 21 for those who are interested. Anyway, for servos I know people use aluminium channel for this sort of thing. But as I didn't have access to any of that, I decided to use 3mm thick grey board to make the enclosure instead. So, here's a quick run through how I created it. First I created the parts to make a small box, 
using a utility knife to cut through the grey board by scoring it several times. I made sure that the card was the same height as the foam so it would sit level with it. I used a servo motor as a template to work out how long and wide the enclosure should be, but used a mini set square to ensure I made the cuts at 90 degrees. Obviously, this is where a 3D printer would have come in very handy, especially as I may have to create dozens of these enclosures if they work. Once I had the sides of the box, I glued them together using my nemesis, rocket card glue. I then left the glue a short while to dry. Next, I began construction of the test rig. I'd already glued some cork to the surface of the form and had made a notch in it where I wanted the tie bar to align. I then attached a point using some track pins. I'll be using copy decks to glue the track down on the layout, but track pins would be fine for this experiment. The next job was to mark where I was going to cut a hole into the form to contain the enclosure box. First, I marked a line extending from the tie bar that would need to align with the servo horn. I then marked around the enclosure box, lining everything up by eye. Next, I cut a hole into the form that was only just large enough to accept the box. I made the hole using sharp chisels, as they seemed to provide a much cleaner and more stable cut than trying to use my utility knife. The enclosure box itself was a few millimetres longer and deeper than the servo, which allowed me a little wiggle room to position the servo to align it with the point's tie bar. Once the enclosure box was inserted into the form and fitted snugly, it was time to join the servo to the tie bar using the push rod. To achieve this, one of the ends of the push rod was bent through 90 degrees. This end would fit into the servo horn. To make sure that the push rod was cut to the correct length, it was offered up to the tie bar while attached to the servo horn and marked using a sharpie pen. Another 90 degree bend was then applied to the push rod and the excess rod cut using a pair of snips. The push rod was then fitted between the servo horn and the tie bar with the rod now aligning with the top of the form. Operating the servo tester gave some very satisfactory results. I decided to leave the spring in the points as not only did the clicking sound give some positive feedback that the point had changed, but the spring would also ensure that the rails stayed firmly pressed together, which was quite important when using insole frog points. So this time, I was a bit happy with the results, and this method would certainly be satisfactory for installing servos in non-scenic areas, but it still looked a bit messy. I thought I could do better though. For my next attempt, I made a much smaller enclosure which was made possible by cutting the mounting brackets from the servo in order to reduce its length. I also turned the servo horn through 180 degrees so that it operated over the servo itself, thus saving more space. The servo was then recessed completely into the enclosure box, so only the push rod was protruding above the form. I'd also decided to run the push rod inside some brass tubing, as this would protect it once installed on the layout. With the push rod protected, it meant that I could also hide the whole mechanism using a simple plate that could be covered in scenery eventually. So, here's a new test rig working with the servo mechanism completely hidden by a makeshift enclosure plate. Pretty neat, eh? Excellent. Now I was happy. So after months of going round and round in circles on how to power points, I'd finally decided to go with servos. That meant I could finally begin to consider laying my track permanently which was a bit of a scary thought, but that's for another series of videos. Okay, so that's about it for this update. If you've got any hints, tips, useful tools or techniques to pass on to a beginner in Engage Modeling, or if you simply want to say hello, then please do so in the comments section. Anything and everything you've got to say will be greatly appreciated. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching. Hopefully I'll have another update on my progress soon. Bye.